Welcome to Simplify Science Selects, Lecture 3.3, Alive and Well. We start this with a quote from the great Paul McCartney. I am alive and well and unconcerned about the rumors of my death, but if I were dead, I would be the last to know. Our learning goals, students will describe the structure of a virus, explain the infection cycle, and understand risks and prevention. What we already know is that there is a taxonomy that separates all kinds of living organisms in the different groups and that life is diverse. What we learned in the lab is that viruses have different ways that they can spread, living organisms have different methods of trying to prevent viruses from spreading, and viruses are simple and efficient. The alive or not alive question is an interesting question. Um, the, we have to define it first, and what do those words mean? What, is it, what does it mean to live? It's easy to define what it means to not live. I think it's obvious to point at things around us and to look at our uh, pencil or look at our desk or look at the floor and say these things are not alive. And so uh, that, that, that seems very clear to us, but to describe what is alive becomes more challenging. We have to make a list of characteristics of things that are alive. So some ideas is things that maintain homeostasis. We, you should recall from a previous year that homeostasis means to uh, maintain certain conditions, to keep yourself the same, that if there is some kind of alteration to your state, that you have some kind of mechanism to get back to that state, um, whether that's maintaining uh, temperature or water levels or um, anything, anything that's important to the organism. Um, living things tend to use energy. They use energy to do stuff. Uh, for whatever reasons, different organisms do different things. Uh, they should grow. Uh, there's there's change. They're, they're not static. Um, reproduce is important. Um, you know, that's kind of the goal of most life forms is to make another life form, if not several, and respond to their environment, respond to stimulus. So that if there's um, something that happens, there's a, uh, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. And uh, reproduce is, you know, such an important part that we put on there twice. Now, what's interesting in the sciences is, uh, different from other subjects, is the simplest questions tend to be the hardest for us to answer. Other subjects are kind of the opposite. You start with easy questions, and easy questions are easy, and you get to hard questions, and hard questions are hard. Uh, our, if, you, if you, the question gets too easy in science, it flips back around and becomes hard again. It's, uh, it's frustrating like that. So the question is, is a virus alive? Um, maybe, I guess, is the best answer. Um, I guess as close as we got is um, almost. Now, that's probably about as good of a consensus that you can get in the community in terms of what we've decided the word alive means. And, um, you know, let, let, let's be clear, what we're really talking about is just the definition of a word. We're not talking about discovering whether or not something has this property or doesn't have this property. What we're arguing about is, what does that word mean? What properties are necessary before we're going to let you have that label? So the, the best that we have is almost. Viruses are almost alive. They have a lot of the things that we talked about, but they don't have quite enough of them. So the word virion refers to a single virus. The word virus is actually plural. Uh, very basic virion, um, minimum two parts. The first part is going to be the part that protects it, keeps it in place, it breaks into cells, it's the outer part. The second part is the code that's going to hijack the host cell and reprogram it to make new viruses. So, two parts. So, that first part we talked about, we call the capsid. 
Capsids are made out of proteins. They come in different shapes, but ultimately their purpose is to allow protection. It prevents the inner code from being chemically altered, destroyed, accessed, messed with. Um, attachment. It makes it so that it'll bind and stick to certain places. Uh, there's very specific kinds of cells that the code is going to be able to uh, work with or that we're going to be able to get through. And so the attachment makes sure that sticking to cells that we're going to be able to work with, uh, cells that will be a good host and not to cells that won't be a good host. And entry. Uh, we need to get through the outer layers of the host cell and get inside where the business happens. So that's all that first part of the virion. The second part is the genetic material. Uh, some viruses will use DNA as a genetic material and some use RNA. Uh, two different um, you know, types of chemicals but have the same purpose. The purpose of that nucleic acid is to be the code that tells the host cell to make new viruses. It's that reproduction part that we had discussed that's uh, so important. The nucleic acid contains the complete code on how to construct new viruses. That way, if we can hijack the cell, get the code in there, the code tells it how to make new viruses, and the cycle repeats. Other specialized viruses can have other parts. Like I said, those two that we discussed are the most basic, a capsid and some nucleic acid, some kind of genetic material. Now, other viruses can have other parts. Um, it's not uncommon for them to have an envelope, a lipid envelope. It's a fatty envelope. It's an additional level of protection. It's a different way of attachment. Uh, it would go around the capsid. So you not only have this protein, but you have this fatty layer. Um, some viruses, particularly bacteriophages, have extended parts of the protein that attach to the capsid. These are more proteins um, that are going to be uh, tails. And what they do is allow us to... Other viruses will have some defensive particles. It'll um, help keep the virus from uh, being infected. Um, there can be parts that will um, destroy parts of the inside of the cell. Um, there's all kinds of different viruses out there, and so th these are specialized components. Whenever we use the word viroid and prion, uh, these are highly specialized words. So viroids are similar to viruses, but these are plant-specific viruses. Um, what's interesting about the viroid, the thing to note about them, is they have that genetic code part, but they don't have that capsid part. The capsid part's not necessary whenever you're trying to infect a plant. Uh, prions are very technical. Um, they're, they work in very different ways. Uh, they're actually most more recently discovered even to exist, and uh, you know we've only recently discovered some of the things that they can do. Um, they're only the protein part. They don't have the genetic material part. So they have to do with messing up how other proteins work and how they fold and uh, mess with that. So viroids and prions are um, a little smaller, a little bit different than viruses. Remember we said a virus is a protein and the genetic material. In this case, a viroid is only the genetic material and a prion is only the protein. Now viruses cause infections. Um, there is no pathway that the virus can do that doesn't involve infecting a host cells. All viruses are bad. So they belong to a group called pathogens. This is from the Greek word pathos, which means suffering, and the Greek genus, which means producing. So what that means is that pathogens are suffering producing. They cause infection. Now, viruses aren't the only kinds of pathogens. Uh, there are more kinds of pathogens. Um, some bacteria and some fungi can be pathogenic. Most aren't. Most bacteria are not, uh, do not cause any harm. Uh, most fungi don't either, and uh, very few microorganisms do, but some of them. Um, all viruses do. 
And so the way that they infect us goes through a cycle. So this word, the lytic cycle, comes from the Greek word lysis, which means loosening. We use this word lysis in science. What we really mean is the destruction of a cell. It loosens up the barrier, the cell membrane that connects it, until the cell ruptures, falls apart. Uh, so anytime we see lice, uh, L-Y-S-E, uh, we're talking about destroying a cell. The, what the viruses are doing with the cells is using them to make more viruses, and uh, the cells just kind of make viruses until they die. So this lytic cycle goes through um, five steps. So we're looking at a bacteria phage right here. This is a virus that's going to infect this bacterium. So step one is attachment. So this bacteria is using those proteins that attaches it to the host cell. It's identified this as a viable cell and it sticks to it. Now the virus can't move, the virus is just floating around. And when it happens to bump into the bacteria, it sticks. Step two is entry. So we said that one of the function of those proteins is to get through the outer protection of the bacteria. So that blue right there represents the genetic material and the gray represents the protein. So the blue genetic material is moving into my bacteria cell here. Step three is replication. So what's happening now is that genetic code that's inside there has told the cell what to make. And cells don't think, they just follow instructions. And the instructions they have is to make these parts. And so the cell makes parts. Step four is assembly or construction. It's taking all those little parts and starts putting them together. And then step five, lysis. Remember we said lysis is when the cell ruptures. It literally explodes out and all of these new viruses are going to float out into the uh, liquids around and float around until they happen to bump into another viable host cell, and the cycle continues. So these are those five steps. Attachment, entry, replication, construction, lysis. And then this, we just wait until we get another opportunity to do attachment. There is a slightly more complicated cycle that just adds on uh, a little bit. This is the lysogenic cycle. So that lyso is that same word we saw from lytic, uh, lysis, it's that rupture. Um, but it has that suffix genic, which if you recall uh, from pathogenic means producing. So this just doesn't, in a lysis, we went straight to cell death, to the lysis stage. In lysogenic, it's going to produce that cell death, but there's a pause step in the middle where we wait. So after uh, we go through step one attachment and step two entry, but before we get to, to replication, um, we have a little bit of stuff that happens here in the middle. Um, typically, uh, the lytic cycle would go straight into making parts, straight into making. So if we were following here, we'd go, um, you know, uh, attachment to entry, and then we go straight to making parts, assembling, rupture. So this big arrow here represents what would happen if we were skipping straight through the lytic cycle. So we can see there's two more intermediate steps that have been added to make the cycle not just lytic cycle, but to lysogenic cycle. So there are two middle steps. So in this case, the we have a combine. So the genetic material goes through the entry, it's inside the cell, and then it combines with the normal DNA. And then it waits. As that cell goes about doing its normal thing and making daughter cells, those future daughter cells all inherit. Now we have a bunch of cells that all have the same genetic material as uh, mother to daughter over and over and over. We can have generations this might go on for. Now at some point, replication begins. We start the step where we start making virus parts. 
each virus is different on what it takes to initiate replication or why it might happen. Um, some do it sooner, some do it faster, some do it later, uh, some only do it at certain temperatures, some it's random. Um, it just depends. Um, it waits. So we can see there's kind of a kind of a fork in the road right here in the middle where after we've gone through entry and injected the material, if the type of virus goes through the lysogenic cycle, it's going to combine. If it's the type of virus that only goes to the lytic cycle, it skips those other steps and it goes straight to making viruses and we're going straight to lysis. Now, all living things can be infected by different types of viruses. It's not just humans that get that, but that specific virus is specific to that kind of group. Um, Viruses that infect trees are safe to humans, and viruses that infect humans are safe to bacteria. Uh, you've probably been around when your cat or dog has had a cold. Uh, the cold is caused by a viral infection. You might have seen your cat or dog sneeze, but we don't catch colds from cats or dogs. Now, if our family members have a cold and they're sneezing and we have an extended exposure to them, we can catch a cold from them because that virus that infects humans can infect us too because we're humans. But uh, they're pretty specific, so they don't, they don't move around just anything. But all, all life out there has different kinds of viruses that infect it. There are human viruses, there are cat viruses, there are tree viruses, there are bacteria viruses, there are viruses that infect fungus. And anything that's, that's alive out there is, has a possibility. There is a chance that there's a kind of virus out there that will infect it. Um, nothing, nothing is 100% immune. So... Whenever we talk about the kind of viruses that affect bacteria, because bacteria is such a huge group, we give it a fancy name, bacteriophage. So um, the only thing that word means is it's the kind of virus that affects bacteria. That, that, that's it. Um, because of the differences in our bacteria, as we discussed before, being prokaryotes versus our fungi and protist and um, plants and animals that are eukaryotes, it gives them a little bit of differences. And so the proteins that um, attach and get entry are slightly different. So those outside proteins really cause us differences in shapes. So we see, um, you know, these kind of um, cylindrical, kind of helical uh, viruses. We see these ones that form these fancy geometric shapes. We see these ones that are kind of round and prickly. Uh, these are all viruses um, you know, that can affect all kinds of things. Um, but the one that affects bacteria specifically, the bacteriophage, it looks like this. So you have that normal part up there, but it's this tail and these little fibers that stick to it. That, uh, that really identifies as a bacteriophage. So these top four pictures are uh, illustrations, but these um, bottom four is actually using medical imaging. Uh, you can see they're really, really quite, quite small. Uh, the key shows you 50 nanometers. So there are all kinds of diseases that humans can get, and uh, they can come from all kinds of different things. We can have genetic defects. We can have environmental factors. Sometimes we get uh, infected by bacteria. Sometimes we get infected by viruses. Um, in terms of viral diseases, uh, we've talked uh, the common cold is, is caused by a virus. Um, influenza, the flu. Um, smallpox, chickenpox, mumps, measles, rubella, herpes, HIV, HPV, uh, all of these are different kinds of conditions that humans can contract if they get a virus into their system that's, you know, hijacked their host cells. Uh, the picture there on the left is uh, some of the symptoms that we see from someone who has the measles. Now, treatment of diseases caused by viruses is very difficult. One, we can't kill them because they're not alive. And two, they're inside our own cells. They're using our cells as hosts. And uh, we don't want to kill all of our cells. Like we have, 
kind of collateral damage. You know, they've taken hostages, uh, if you want to think of that as a metaphor. So there's two kinds of drugs that we can take. Uh, some of them just alleviate our discomfort and symptoms. They just make us a little happier uh, while our body's natural immune system solves the problem. The natural immune system in our body is pretty good about taking care of most viruses. And so sometimes we just need to, uh, you know, alleviate our fever, get rid of the pain, uh, to, you know, take some Tylenol or, um, you know, also acetaminophen, um, or, or whatever, and just kind of weather it out, you know, sweat it out. There are some antiviral drugs. They are not capable of killing the virus, but uh, there's some that kind of get, a, get in the way of its process of reproducing, uh, that kind of get in the way of the cycle and slow it down so that they can't move quite so quickly. Um, there are some viruses, we have some antiviral drugs, uh, but making antiviral drugs is not very easy. Um, antibiotics don't work on viruses because, and look at that word, antibio, against life. Antibiotics work on living things like bacteria. Antibiotics don't work on viruses because they're not alive. Since trying to treat viruses is so challenging, we really focus on prevention. Prevention is really the key. The number one way is to still limit exposure. So those proteins that are on the viruses are specific to the types of cells. Uh, so it's not just specific to organisms. It can be specific to types of cells on that organism. You know, there are, there are some viruses that are, you know, susceptible just to us uh, breathing, just bre being around them in the air. Uh, you know, we can breathe them in and they'll get through. Um, there are some viruses that, you know, is, won't infect us through our skin. So it's important that we wash our hands because if the virus is on our hand, it won't necessarily infect us. We can wash it off. But if we don't wash our hands as we touch our lips or our nose or our eyes, we can move those viruses towards cells and put them on cells that they can't infect. Uh, that's the reason that hand washing is important. Our skin cells are... Um, have pretty good defenses, um, but some of those, you know, thinner membranes, like in our mouth and our nose and our eyes, uh, might be spots that the virus um, can attach to. There are other viruses that uh, need access to blood, um, or that might be sexually transmitted, um, but it's a very specific kind of cells. And so just limiting your exposure to the viruses is the best way to go about it. The second best uh, method of prevention is vaccines. Not every virus out there have we found a good vaccine for, um, but we found a lot of good ones. So vaccines take advantage of our natural immune system, which we've already discussed is by far the best treatment. And what the vaccine does is it speeds up the time of our immune response. It makes it so that our immune response can happen much quicker, so that the virus doesn't have enough time to keep spreading cell to cell to cell to cell. And basically what we do is the vaccines that we make have inactive parts of the viruses, and by putting those inactive parts into our body, our body can study them and our immune system will uh, recognize that pathogen without the risk of infection so that in the future, if that pathogen is present, uh, your body already recognizes it before and it can immediately start the immune response instead of trying to figure out what it is and then later starting the immune response. Uh, a good example here is a, a basic graph of uh, decades down here and then how many cases per thousands there were in the years. So uh, we can see in the 50s and the 60s, you know, we were getting uh, 400,000, 700,000, 750,000 cases of measles every year. Um, we can see that it looks, you know, somewhere in the mid-60s, the measles vaccine was licensed. And uh, that means it was approved for distribution. And you see in the following years, it was starting to get out and people were starting to get it. And you can see by the uh, 
by the 70s, uh, most people had the measles vaccine, and look how far down, we're under 50,000. Uh, by today, uh, measles is pretty much gone. Um, so many people have had the vaccine that the virus hasn't been able to spread. Uh, the topic of vaccines being dangerous is um, become kind of controversial, but it's uh, it's an interesting problem that we have in science because uh, everybody has an opinion, but it's not always based on our research. And in science, the big thing that we try to do is evidence-based reasoning. Uh, we don't go on, we, we try to avoid bias, we try to avoid going to our fears. It's really difficult to do. We have to constantly remind ourselves what the facts say. Um, when it comes down to it, there is no connection um, of, of vaccines being linked to anything like autism. Um, it is normal for, you know, your whenever you get a shot in your arm, your arm will be sore, um, you know, things like that. Uh, you can have a mild immune response while your immune system is adapting. Uh, it doesn't mean that vaccines have 0% risk. Uh, there is a very small population that, uh, you know, can have allergies, but um, they're far, far less risk than the risk of being exposed to those diseases. Now, there's also a group of people that have weakened immune systems. Um, you know, some certain types of uh, cancer patients or the extreme elderly. Um, people that have some kind of um, immune, um, immune response disease, it prevents them from being vaccinated because their immune system won't be able to mount the defense anyways. Uh, it's a very small percentage of the population. Uh, the good news, though, is if a high enough percentage of the people surrounding them has the vaccine, then their immune systems prevent the virus from being copied and spread, and then those people that can't get the vaccine aren't exposed to it because there's not enough host cells to keep reproducing it. Uh, this idea of the vast majority protecting the minority is called herd immunity. So um, there's um, some examples of some viruses like chickenpox or hepatitis A, mumps, rabies, uh, West Nile. Uh, we're talking about Zika these days. And uh, some of the symptoms, how it's transmitted, and uh, vaccine recommendations. You can see that there's a lot of differences virus to virus. Uh, some interesting uh, numbers. The uh, left shows the um, number of cases uh, reported in one year versus the right uh, shows after vaccine. So, you know, we can see uh, what a dramatic uh, improvement in the quality of life that um, vaccines have gone. Uh, and look at diphtheria from 21,000 cases a year to zero. Uh, look at hepatitis A from 117,333 down to 11,000. Uh, look at measles, you know, over half a million, and then down to 61 cases. Now, some of those names of those viruses are foreign to us, like uh, polio. The polio isn't a disease that we talk a lot, you know, in today's modern generation, because people don't really get polio anymore. If you talk to older generations, they remember the horrors of polio and, uh, you know, the, the fear and um, the crippling effects it would have. Um, polio has, the polio vaccine has been so successful and was spread so far that polio has been entirely eradicated from the United States. There were, there, the virus pretty much doesn't exist anymore. Um, you can see how rapidly when the polio vaccine was uh, widely spread, um, you can see the slope of that line plummeting down. Um, but if you have, you know, if you know people in older generations that were alive there in the 50s, um, chances are they knew someone 
who um, suffered from polio. And it was a scary thing. And we're fortunate that this word polio doesn't mean much to us anymore. Now, some vaccines are better than others. The polio vaccine is an example of one that was extremely effective. Uh, the flu vaccine is an example of one that's not very effective. Um, polio was a very specific single virus. There's only one virus that caused polio. Uh, the word influenza is actually attributed to tons of different flu viruses, and they're constantly changing. So um, every year there's a different flu vaccine, and the flu virus keeps changing, so the flu vaccine has to keep changing. It's still a fairly effective vaccine, but it reduces your odds by about 50%. Depends on the year. Some are forty percent. Some are seventy percent. It, it depends on the year. Um, it still helps, but it's not a guarantee. Um, nothing's a guarantee. The point, though, is that uh, less risk. Um, the polio vaccine uh, had a very high percentage, so much that uh, we were able to eradicate polio. Obviously, we're nowhere near eradicating the flu. Um, but, you know, it's been a while since we've had, uh, you know, a major epidemic. We use the word epidemic whenever there's a virus outbreak and it spreads rapidly and uncontrolled. Fortunately, we live in a, uh, a country that has a fairly well-advanced uh, healthcare system. We're able to identify and stop uh, things like that before they get to epidemics.